Hello oh, and welcome to the Wrangling Windows 10 Security webinar and it's really Wrangling Windows 10 Security with Configuration Manager presented by Paul Winstonley and Morris Daly. Take a quick look at uh, who we are. So I think you know Paul and Morris. Paul is a Microsoft MVP and a Configuration Manager Consultant. You can find him on Twitter at SCC Mentor. And Morris is a Microsoft MVP as well and a principal consultant at TrueSec. And he's at MoDaily underscore IT. Good morning, guys. Hi there. Good morning, what, Bill. MoDaily underscore IT. What is the uh, is Maurice Daily and what is the IT just for information technology, I suppose? Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it, so seemed, people... <laughs> it seemed more exotic at first, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I'm Bill Burnett, Director of Product. Not that your tweets aren't amazing, Morris. <laughs> um, Thanks, Bill. Bill. I'm Bill Burnett, Director of Product Marketing at Adaptiva, and uh, my Twitter is at IT Systems Man, which is the, I just went for the most boring possible Twitter name I could find. <laughs> <laughs> Take a quick look at our agenda here. It's, uh, and again, this is all security and it's all with Configuration Manager and some Intune thrown in as well for people who are either shifting or considering the shift. So we're gonna be looking at Windows 10 updating, Windows Defender Suite, configuration and security baselines, the importance of BIOS and security maintenance, disk encryption and how to manage, Extending Configuration Manager with Adaptiva. So I'll give you just a quick look at some of the things we offer here at Adaptiva and a point or two. If you want to learn more, you can go to a webinar. I'm not going to get into any detail here. Just give you an idea of if, it, if it's something you want to learn more about. And then there will be a Q&A and ride off into the sunset. Quick look at <clears throat> uh, Adaptiva. Adaptiva was founded in 2004 by Deepak Kumar who was one of the uh, lead managers creating SMS. And he founded Adaptiva with the mission to significantly simplify and reduce the cost of enterprise IT management and security through the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. And since that time, uh, he has built and refined and you know built more this uh, the world's first smart scaling network adaptive endpoint management platform. And it's become uh, rather widely used. And we'll show you some of our customers here in a moment. We have two main products. One site is uh, for software delivery and client health is for client health and security. So a lot of Fortune 1000 enterprises worldwide and global uh, 1000 enterprises use us. And we have uh, customer success in every vertical. So really it's, it's anybody who has need for managing endpoints. And we have uh, top tier partners. And that's really all I'm gonna say is a little picture of who we are. I know you want the tech, so I'm gonna hand over now to uh, Paul and Morris. Thanks for the introduction, Bill. Um, so, I mean, before we get started on, on the slides when we go through this, um, I mean, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're both consultants, so we see a lot of different scenarios uh, in, in terms of security, updating, encryption in our day job. And and it's not really about doing things wrong or right. It's, you know, people have done things for generations, you know, going back to Windows XP and 7, and they, they've kind of got used to, uh, you know, maintaining sets of products or, or security settings. And... One of the things we're going to try to uncover here is what is under the hood in Windows 10 that you're not leveraging. Exactly. Um, yeah. um, you know, we have a lot of enterprises that uh, are interested in the Microsoft security stack, for example, um, but they have problems understanding what that offers um, and, and whether there's there's any gaps that need to be filled if they want to shift off any kind of third party products. Um, an easy win is, is BitLocker moving across to that. But the AV side, the Defender Suite, a little bit more uh, work is needed, isn't it, really, to, to shift them over? It, it is, yeah. And, and we've talked about this and that, and the, the kind of legacy products that are in people's environments. And, you know, there, there are some great top-tier vendors providing that stuff. Um, and, you know, it's not to knock what's there, but as you transition to Windows 10 with enterprise licensing, you, you get a lot under the hood these days. So it's it's worth evaluating what you can and, 
you know, maybe saving money in, in, in certain areas and then putting back yeah. in others, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, yeah so, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think you'll be delving a bit deeper into some of those aspects around the security side and the Defender Suite itself. Um, so I think, we'll, shall we kick start now uh, and crack on with section one? Yeah, let's talk about the uh, the big changes coming up and updating today. Cool. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Um, as we mentioned, our first topic is around the Windows Update uh, 10 updating uh, model and what's currently in place and what's coming. Okay, so this is where we're currently at. Uh, as I say, things are changing and we're going to run through that very shortly. Um, as you can see, we're talking about quality updates here rather than feature updates. If, you, if you're not sure of the differences, then a feature update is the semi-annual uh, update we get twice a year uh, in March and September, which gives us new features in Windows 10. Uh, the quality updates, however, are our uh, monthly updates. And we can uh, have, we can, there's three different flavors of these that we can deploy out. Um, these are the full update the Delta and the Express. And as you can see, um, size-wise, they, they vary. Uh, and the first one that I'm going to focus on is the cumulative update or the, the full update. Um, these grow over the life cycle of a, of a baseline, hence cumulative. Um, they grow very big, very quickly, um, and can get to over a gigabyte in size uh, very early on in the life cycle. And with Microsoft extending the life cycle of a base release, you can see that these will grow considerably. So there's some challenge there for admins around network bandwidth consumption and also around the disk space requirements on distribution points to store these updates, particularly if you're dealing with different baseline releases or if you're um, dealing with different architecture, for example. Uh, a little bit of that pain has been eased recently. Uh, in Config Manager uh, 1806, you can now filter out architecture when you're creating your ADRs or your software update groups. Um, so if you're not using x86, then you can discard that particular architecture. Um, <clears throat> the next update type is the Delta update. These generally tend to be around 300 to 500 meg per month. Um, they feature changes to the OS components. Um, and they're, they're not cumulative. Um, so therefore, you need to have the previous installation in place. A little bit more hand-holding is required to get those updates out to your endpoints. Uh, finally, there's the Express update model, um, roughly around 100 to 200 meg per, uh, per month. Um, and these are differential in nature. Uh, you only download, or the client only downloads what's required. Um, if a device is more up-to-date, Obviously, then there's less required to be downloaded. That payoff, unfortunately, only happens at the client end. There's a, quite a huge impact on distribution points. Uh, and the reason for this is um, due to the differential nature. If a, a, a file changes in, say, an October update, then the differential changes for September to October, um, August to October, etc., right back to the original base version of the file is, is required and generated. So quite a considerable uh, bloat occurs on the distribution point. And only really if you're in environments that have got a lot of disk space on the DP should you look at uh, implementing express updates. Okay, so let's take a look at the new model. Um, this was announced by Microsoft back in August. And it's worth noting, that whilst we've discussed Delta updates, they're actually, from today, uh, they're, they're phased out and they're no longer supported for older Windows 10 releases. Um, this new quality update model is um, going to be implemented in the next major version of Windows 10, so the 1903 uh, baseline release and, all, uh, and, and Windows Server as well. Uh, and you can take a look here at this graph. The quality updates, the new uh, style of quality update is considerably smaller um, and you'll have a beneficial uh, impact there on trying to store this on your distribution points but also getting this across the network. Um, Microsoft estimate that there'll be roughly around uh, 100 to 300 meg in size per month and um, they are um, cumulative but they work in a different way to um, the cumulative 
update itself and also the express update if, in which they only um, contain two differentials for any revised file. Um, that's a forward differential that goes from the, the base release of the, of the file up to the uh, version that you're applying, but also a reverse differential from that version back to the uh, base release. Um, they'll also contain um, new files uh, called null differentials, uh, and these are compressed versions uh, of the file to again reduce that amount of storage required and the, the size of the uh, package itself. Okay, so how are these updates going to be applied onto our endpoints? Uh, a couple of transformations are required to get these applied. Um, let's start off by um, introducing a little bit of terminology. I've been referring to base versions uh, so far in, in, the, in this discussion. And um, what we mean by that is a major release version. So for example, the 1903 baseline, the first uh, release that will feature these, this new update type. Um, I'll also be mentioning revision versions. These are our minor releases or our patches that come out on a monthly basis. So a May or a July patch for 1903, for example. So the first transformation that needs to take place uh, is if we have a copy, or sorry, the base copy of a file on our system. And what needs to happen is we need to go from that base version, which Microsoft called V0, to the target release version. Um, and they term that VN using that first transformation. If our devices have a version of the file, uh, for example, the May patch, then two transformations need to apply to get that update onto the device. Uh, what we do is we go from version N, the May release, and have a reverse differential back to the RTM release. Secondly, we go from the base version through to our new target release version, uh, the July patch, for example. Note that endpoints will be storing the reverse differential of the file version that they're on at all times. So um, our devices will use that in conjunction with this forward differential. Okay. So how exactly are the uh, updates applied? Let's take a, an overview of that. Um, the first step of the process will be that all files will need to be identified for installation. The next phase uh, will be that each necessary file will be hydrated onto the system, uh, the reverse, the forward, and the nulls. Um, and each of these will be stored in the Win SXS component store. Uh, full files will be created using the transformations, because if you note here, we're actually using differentials at all times. Um, by using the transformations, we can create these full files. For example, uh, for example, the N to base back to R releases. And then there'll be the process of actually installing all the components that we need onto the system. Finally, there'll be a cleanup process that takes place, uh, removing the previous reverse differential, but leaving the most recent reverse differential in place. And this is used for any kind of uh, restoration or repair work. If there's any kind of uh, corruption detected during the update process, uh, then an automatic corruption repair will take place. And the device will, will check in with Windows Update against a file called the baseless patch storage file or the baseless PSF. And it will use this file to fix any uh, corrupted manifest, uh, differentials or full files. And that repair process will take place um, prior to any installation. So that's the, the overview of the new model. And ultimately, uh, we've not seen this in action yet, but the benefits speak for themselves in, fact, in, in the fact that they reduce the overall consumption in network bandwidth, allowing us to get the updates out across our estates and also reduce the amount of storage that we've needed on our config manager endpoints. Um, and that's it. That's the summary there of Windows updating uh, the new model for us. Um, so it's over to Morris now to give us some more information.
on yeah, the thanks. Suite. thanks, Paul. So I was just thinking one of those screens gave me a horrible flashback to my physics class, but it was well explained. Um, okay, so that, that's updates in a, in a nutshell. Um, we won't talk about how, how you, you know, push them out. We, we can chat about that in Q&A if you want as well. Um, but let's have a look at the Windows Defender Suite now. And it's one of these products, as, as we said, that as you transition across from your legacy Windows 7 or even back as far as Windows XP environments across to Windows 10, um, something can get overlooked is this underlying antivirus, anti-malware engine, uh, which does much more than just what it says, uh, you know, when you look at it from a from a uh, application point of view, it looks very simplistic compared to some of the other big vendors that are out there. Um, but under the hood, there is a range of um, security options that are available in the product. And some of these are controlled, you know, you can control by PowerShell um, through configuration manager as well. And that's what we're going to focus on now, um, but also through Intune. So no matter what your management platform, um, you can leverage these features to do things like um, attack surface reduction, um, application control, um, you know, deploying firewall rules, or even leveraging um, your E5 licensing with Microsoft 365 for uh, uh, Windows Defender ATP, which is a, a great solution for being proactive and monitoring what goes on in your environment to detect changes so that if a user, for instance, does, you know, they use Word, they use Office through the day, and uh, they have a general pattern. And then all of a sudden at 3 a.m., um, their machine is spinning up PowerShell instances under their user account, trying to get across the network. You know, that's different. And then you can mitigate against that and you can flag to administrators and so on. So. Um, there's really a lot in here that we need to talk about. And some of which, I mean, even from a configuration manager perspective, is actually completely hidden away if you don't know about it. So typically, you know, when we interact with clients, we go out and see what they're using. And often you'll find the case that under the uh, endpoint protection node in um, configuration manager console, you won't see the likes of uh, exploit guard replication control listed. And that's because they are an additional feature that need to be enabled. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind that when you're comparing the products, you really need to ensure that all the features are turned on before you can actually really do a, an apples with apples comparison. Um, the important thing to mention here, as it does catch some people, is the licensing requirements. So if you're a Windows 10 Pro customer, um, basically the a whole range of the security features that are in Windows 10 Enterprise are missing. Um, so I would urge you to look at your state to see, is it worth stepping up to Windows 10 Enterprise? And if so, what could you do to maybe offset some of the cost? But again, one of the things that we recommend to a lot of our customers is you know look at this microsoft 365 model because they've taken the best of what they've done with office 365 integrated it and given you the likes of your enterprise license for windows so um, you can then leverage all of these features so i mean some of the the options that we have these are exploit guard options attack surface reduction um what does that do so Basically, we're on about containerizing um, portions of the OS so that the traditional hacking techniques where you know, the malicious content gets access to the user session are negated through isolation. Um, and attack surface reduction rules can be set up in Configuration Manager so that they can do a number of different things so that you know, they can protect against um, scripts running or executables of VPS and so on. Um, and that typically happens with the, the Edge browser. Um, so 
it's one of the the nice new features of Edge. I know some people have complained about Edge, and we've seen obviously Microsoft have come back and said that they're building a new version, which is going to be Chromium based. But um, but really, Edge as a browser is very security focused. So the underlying core bits of the operating system work with it to protect against um, malware infections in this isolated type environment. Um, network protection. Uh, uh, again, this is something where you can specify um, your DNS domain names, your IP address ranges, and so on, so that you are telling the system, I have a protected environment, and it looks like this. Anything outside of that, treat as untrusted and apply rules. Um, again, the, the rules are all very straightforward, set up, all done through the, the configuration manager console, or again, through PowerShell or Intune. Um, and really and truly, you need to get familiar with those, again, comparing with the likes of an, another endpoint protection product. What, one of the things that I like about this whole suite of, the, of um, security folks solutions is the control folder access. So if we go back, you know, two years, three years or so on, the rise in ransomware really got people thinking about how do I protect against ransomware infections over writing all my files? Um, and Microsoft did some great work, you know, so that you could protect all of your files up to OneDrive for business. And that's absolutely great. A lot of enterprises that they use um, folder redirection and they, they've got traditional file servers and maybe they haven't moved. So what this does is it negates against, again, behavior that's unexpected. So if a ransomware infection all of a sudden comes in and wants to rename a whole bunch of files or start encrypting everything in your My Documents, you can automatically mitigate against this. And it's something that we can show here. So setting this up through Configuration Manager is very simple. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see I've got my console and I've got a, an exploit guard policy set up. And all I'm going to do is control, control folder access and block. And what that's going to do is it's going to take the kind of the known folders that you would have, so like some my documents, but you can specify additional folders. Um, the same setup process is available in Intune. So it's through the uh, Defender Exploit Guard policies and then control folder access. Again, very easy to implement. And if you want to test it via PowerShell, you can see down the bottom, you have set MP preference, uh, enable control folder access. So what does this look like uh, in terms of a, a demonstration of what it does? So here in recording, I've got a, a tool which Bill gave me actually, it's from Adaptiva, so I trust Bill. Um, I can see that the company's Adaptiva and I'm just gonna run it as an administrator because Bill told me to. Um, again, looks branded, brilliant. And it's gonna download the contents of the webinar today. So we'll click on start download. And off it goes and it's gonna download all the content. And then the next thing we notice that we've got an unauthorized change blocked. And we can see that it's actually trying to do something to the documents. Now, Bill's told me this might happen. And if it does, just disable the antivirus because that's just a bug. So let's go ahead and disable the antivirus. OK, we can concede it, it's turned off. OK, now all of a sudden, what we don't actually realize here as an end user is something's going on in the background. Um, now, again, you can mitigate against being able to turn off the AV, for instance, with you know group policy settings. But for this purpose of this demo, I'm just going to show what would actually happen if the, uh, the end user had sufficient rights. Oh, and now my files are encrypted. So the user starts panicking and they're looking around and they're trying to get back to their My Documents.
And in this example, I mean, this is just a PowerShell application that I created for demonstration purposes, but all it's doing is it's changing everything to an encrypted file. But it would be far worse, obviously, if something was changing it to a ransomware encrypted file where you don't have a recovery key. So when you're implementing this kind of stuff, you really need to get familiar with how to troubleshoot and look to see what's going on in the background. So in that example, when we look at the event viewer under application services logs, Microsoft Windows and Windows Defender, you'll see that the action has been recorded there. So it's modifying files in the user profile documents and has been blocked by control folder access. Um, now, the example I have is, again, is done in PowerShell, but Microsoft actually provide um, testing tools for the full range of all the tests that the um, Defender would mitigate against on the, the link, which you'll see down below. Um, and their site, you can obviously point at a specific directory and it'll come up and it'll show you what ransomware would look like if it, if it wasn't mitigated against. So now let's have a, a look at a network protection demo. So here we're just trying to see if network protection is turned on. Okay, so we're just using the uh, set MP preference enable network protection enabled. Okay, we can kind of scroll through the different modes. So you can enable, disable, or you can have audit only. And audit only is one of those things that actually I recommend for a lot of customers when you're implementing these tools, put it in audit, leave it there for a week or a month on the test group and see what's going on. So in this instance, we have network protection enabled. And again, when we've, we've gone to the site, which is provided by Microsoft for test purposes, we can see that it's uh, malicious content and it's automatically being blocked. And that's using the Edge browser. The same process though will actually happen in Internet Explorer. And there we are. So a smart screen is blocking straight away. And if we go and have a look at the event logs, do a refresh, we'll see there that smart screen was blocking a dangerous network connection and it was the process was in Explorer. So it's one of the things that Defender will do with in conjunction with features with, with to make your browser secure. So it's not just about antivirus, anti-malware coming in through the likes of email anymore. It's it's about protecting against websites. And I, I've seen that in the past where people simply browsing onto a website have infected their network of ransomware. Um, so it is something to be very wary of and something that you know can be completely seamless to the user. They, they don't know that this has happened. The next thing, their network administrator is getting calls saying there's hundreds of files changing on our files server. So we don't want to get into any of that type of scenario. So. So the next thing I thought we, we move on to um, is configuration manager and security baselines. Um, so CI, CBs, and for that section, Paul, I'm going to switch back to you. Yep, cheers, Morris. Okay, a bit of a tag team presenting. Um, hopefully you can see that on screen. Um, okay, so we have two um, topics really in this section, uh, configuration and security baselines. Um, the goal of both of those is effectively to get compliant. Uh, and compliancy is the goal we're trying to reach in accordance with any kind of set of guidelines or specifications or the process of trying to become so. Uh, it can encompass uh, efforts to ensure that our business abides by any kind of um, industry regulations or, or government legislation. Uh, in, in SCCM, we can use uh, configuration items uh, and set a configuration baseline to assist with setting up that compliance. Um, 
effectively the baseline is a collection uh, of one or more of these configuration items uh, or, or conditional checks if you like uh, but no we don't always have to use CIs uh, to baseline against and we'll see that shortly in, in the demo. Um, once we've created that baseline we then need to deploy out to um, our targeted devices or uh, via a collection. Um, as I say, the conditional checks, they form the basis for our compliancy. And if any dev devices deviate from that baseline, then we need to remediate that drift. Um, now we can, we can do this in an automated way, uh, but not every uh, thing can be auto remediated. And we'll, again, we'll see this in, in the example uh, shortly. If remediation is possible, then it's worth noting that this occurs immediately upon any kind of non-compliant baseline evaluation. Um, for, configure, uh, for compliance items, sorry, we can use these different types of um, items to, to baseline against. It could be a registry uh, key, a bunch of registry keys, uh, WMI query, uh, a script such as a PowerShell script, for example. Um, if we are using a script, then we need to have uh, something to check against, but also uh, something to remediate against. So a separate remediation script is required in that instance. Uh, for uh, compliance to work, we need to enable a client setting in the uh, client setting policies, and that's the enable compliance evaluation on client setting. And then obviously we need to push that out to our endpoints. Okay, so let's flip to a demo here. Um, as I said, uh, we can use con configuration items to baseline against, but we can also use other things to baseline against. And in this example, I'm going to use uh, software updates as, as an example to check our endpoints for compliancy. And then if there's any issues and any devices that aren't compliant, I can then create remediation to get those in a compliant state. Okay, let's start off by creating the configuration baseline. And this is in our assets and compliance workspace, giving it a name. And as you can see from the dropdown, I have the different types that I can add into baseline against, and I can pick software updates. Uh, in this view here, I can see all the updates that have synchronized against my WSUS. And I'm just going to go through uh, and pick some updates. This could be a bunch of Office uh, 2016 updates, Windows 10 updates, whatever. Uh, for this example, I'm just going to choose a couple of Adobe Flash updates for Windows 10 1809 uh, and, and check those against my devices. OK, it's as simple as that for creating the baseline. Once that's created, in good old uh, config manager style, I need to deploy that out to my uh, targeted devices. So it's, it's always a case of right clicking, choosing deploy, and then going through and browsing for the collection. In this instance, I'm going to push out to my Windows 10 desktops. OK, so at this point, I have to set a, a compliance evaluation schedule defaults to seven days, but I can adjust that accordingly. Uh, this will be when the devices check for compliancy. And if you notice here, we can remediate any non-compliant rules. That's if we can run an, an auto remediation. In this case, I can't because I'm running the software update check. So I'll create my own deployment later to push out to those devices. Okay, and that's, that's created for me and deployed. Now on my endpoint, I've run a policy update, and in the configuration manager applet, you can see in the configurations tab, the assigned configuration baseline has appeared. At the moment, the compliancy state is unknown. If I just quickly evaluate that, I can see that that particular device reports back as non-compliant. And taking a quick look in the installed updates, I do have an Adobe Flash update, but it's not any of the two I'm checking against. Okay, so the beauty of the baseline is that I can actually then go back to the baseline deployment 
uh, right click it and create a new collection from that. And as you can see here, I have a choice of compliant, error, non-compliant and unknowns. <clears throat> and from that, I can auto create a, a collection for these devices. So I'm gonna go in and choose non-compliant. And this will name it automatically for me, create the query for me, job done. I'm gonna just speed up the process here by making that collection incremental, but you know, use that sparingly in your environment. And once that's created, you can see that that particular collection has got the desktop in there and that reports back as non-compliant. So the next step of the process for me is to remediate that. And what I've done in the background is I've gone off and uh, created a software update deployment with those two Adobe Flash updates in it and pushed it out to the non-compliant collection. This particular endpoint has gone ahead and installed. And as you can see here, I've got an extra Adobe Flash player update in installed. Uh, I've gone back in and re-evaluated that baseline and my device now reports back as compliant. Viewing the report, I can see that, well, actually one of those updates wasn't applicable, so that's great. My compliance state is actually compliant and that's how it will report back to Config Manager. And again, I can go back into that baseline deployment and uh, create a compliant collection. And I can see all the devices that populate that. And in this instance here, that particular desktop is now appearing as compliant uh, rather than non-compliant. OK, so a good way we can use SCCM to get our uh, devices in, into a compliant state using the baseline. OK, so the second topic is around security baselines. Um, now, Microsoft uh, release their security baselines per Windows 10 release. Um, these are downloadable for you to install. And um, I really recommend using those as a minimum, really, for secure security baselining your devices. Uh, you could look at other uh, baselines out there to embellish the msft for example you could look at the center for internet security or cis uh, guidelines and also in the uk we have the national cyber security center that issue uh, the their guidelines on how to add to the security baselines that microsoft offer uh, it's worth noting that those two usually are a version or two behind really on on their baseline release um, so if you want to be bang up to date, um, look at kind of creating your own baselines based on those when required. Um, to apply the MSFT baselines on our traditional kind of SCCM AD GPO way, uh, we would uh, copy down the ADMX and ADMLs from the download and we put them into our GPO central store. The next step then would be to import the MSFT configuration the configurated settings and apply those out to our Windows 10 devices. Uh, until recently, it was quite tricky and not built in and not native to Intune to be able to push out any security baselines. And there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of great work around community on, on, on applying these via PowerShell or Graph, etc. Uh, but recently, we've got a public preview of security baselines. So the next demo is just going to give you a quick overview of how to uh, deploy these out to your Intune managed endpoints. So here in my Azure portal in the Intune blade, I've got this option now for security baselines preview. Note here that it's, it's um, called the October 2018 uh, baseline, uh, but it's actually targeted at the 1809 release. And, and built from that MSFT baseline. With anything in Intune, we're going to go out and create a profile. And we'll give that uh, a name. <clears throat> and when I scroll down, you'll be able to see that we have a bunch of settings that we can apply. As I say, these are already pre-populated, but uh, you can go in and change these to whatever you want. 
uh, quite a, a, a bunch of features there to sort of scroll through and, and adjust accordingly. Um, BitLocker here, I uh, can go in and <clears throat> change the encryption method, for example, if I, if I wish to. I'm going to leave that as default and just create that. And once that's created, I need to assign that to my devices. So I've already created in Azure AD a security group uh, with my devices in. And it's just a simple case of selecting that particular group and saving. Simple as that. Uh, at the moment, there's no way of importing any baselines in uh, that you customize. So you have to work on that particular uh, security baseline that's already created for you. But hopefully, that's something that will be coming out. Uh, soon to in June uh, and is on the Microsoft roadmap, fingers crossed. OK, so how do we check this uh, on our devices? Uh, it's a case of hopping into the settings and obviously our device is going to sync every so often with Intune. But we could force that through if we wanted to by clicking the sync button. But this particular device has already picked up a bunch of policies so that uh, process has already taken place. Unlike um, our sort of AD joined uh, Windows 10 devices where we'd normally do a GP result uh, to check at any kind of security GPO settings uh, or, or an RSOP, um, we don't have that luxury unfortunately in uh, Intune managed devices at the moment. So it's a case of drilling into the event logs to see uh, if the policies have applied okay. Uh, this particular uh, log the device management enterprise diagnostic provider gives us the information so we're looking for event ids of 814 and i can drill into these each one of these is an individual policy being applied so if i check the details on this i can see that i've uh, applied um, some power management settings and they've successfully applied for me OK, so that's a nice, simple way of um, pushing out security baselines and getting our devices compliant using Intune. Uh, it's back over to Morris now. He's going to pick up on uh, bar security and maintenance. Thanks, Paul. I mean, it, it, it's really fantastic work that the guys in Morris have been doing with Intune lately. Um, getting stuff ported in that people have been crying out for, and security baselines is just one of the things that I mean, you've got ADMX templates as well, but um, yeah, it, it's a good story for the, the modern management scenario and the co-management as well. But, so now let's um, move on to biosecurity maintenance. So just over, over a year ago, um, there were a bunch of exploits which were out for quite a few years, but they gave the world a bit of a wake up call. And all of a sudden, the whole process of patching machines at a firmware level became real. Um, so this was the Spectra and Meltdown flaws that came out uh, with Intel. Um, and Microsoft were quick to release software patches, but really if you wanted to uh, complete the patch process, you had to do a firmware update. And organizations across the world were looking at you know thousands of machines which typically they got from a, a vendor, they arrived in, they were imaged, and they were put on the desk. And the pro, you know, the process of updating BIOS was never considered. Um, only in rare circumstances where you know, a model had an issue and the, 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 there was a fix for it, it would it have ever come up. Um, but now it is part of the patching regime for a lot of companies. Um, they're looking at this because, you know, the manufacturers release updates for the bias for a reason they are fixing things they're improving stability um i've you know had instances where certain models where you know the tpm disappear completely under a uh, certain version of the bias and you know supplying the update then has fixed that so you really need to build this in and 
it's all about automating the process of doing this. Um, so the, some of the vendors have some great tools that you can apply with Configuration Manager. I mean, HP's done some really good stuff. Uh, so Lenovo and Dell as well. Um, and of course, you've got Surface firmware updates from Microsoft built into the product. Um, but you also need to consider the security aspect that goes with this. So again, companies have really shied away from, okay, do we put a, a password on the BIOS? Um, what, you know, what, why do we need that? Does that not interrupt with what IT help desk people are doing? Or, you know, should the end user be able to go in and change settings in the BIOS? And even if you take that step forward, it's like, you know, the end users were given typically more freedom than they, they should have been historically. So it's taking that back and making sure that the, the legacy freedom that people have been given in an organization doesn't leave their organization open to hacking. And one of the things that we see lately is a shift towards uh, writing firmware updates for the BIOS, which are actually included in malware. Because, you know, the, They've leveraged from a security point of view, if they can't get into the encrypted OS, well, well what do they need to do? They need to get in before the OS boots. And where are they going to do that? It's going to be in the BIOS. So there are vulnerabilities that are coming out um, that you need to protect against. So, I mean, one of the very simple things is enable a password. No password, no way, no, as I say there. Um, it prevents them from applying a patch in the first place. Um, another one of the things that you should enable on all machines moving to Windows 10 is that you should be on UFI mode and you should not just be on UFI mode, but you should be UFI mode with secure boot turned on. And what secure boot does is it, it loads, it reads against protected boot sectors on the drive to see if it matches a known good uh, signature. And if it does, the, the, the operating system then boots. And that's good for two things. Uh, one, you've verified that it's it's signed by a uh, an expected vendor, so it shouldn't contain any malware. Uh, but the other thing that can happen is if you're changing settings in the BIOS and it's in legacy mode, um, if you've got BitLocker or even some third-party disk encryption, they don't like that really happening. It's kind of an unexpected event, and it might trigger a recovery event. Uh, so again, by enabling secure boot, it's knowing that it's okay. I'm using a protected ID. I'm going to boot the system, so it's going to accept those commands without throwing your kind of typical recovery uh, page up at you. Um, so I mean, here I've got some of the um, links to some of the vendor uh, management solutions that are out there. Um, there's community driven solutions as well. So myself and uh, Nikolai Anderson, the fellow MVP, we came up with a, a means of automating the bias management um, for HP, Lenovo, and Dell. Um, and yep, it's a simple web service. It calls a web service and calls a packaging configuration manager and then updates it. Um, it is that straightforward. It just checks the version number and updates as you need to. Um, and Gary Block has done some great stuff as well on uh, using the Dell command suite to update biases through the task sequence. And even getting to a point where, you know, if, if you're concerned about um, having packages all around your distribution points, that you can do the stuff live over the internet. You might have to really think about the considerations if you're, you know, doing this at mass and there's thousands of machines grabbing stuff from the internet. Um, your network guy might get a little bit angry, but again, it is doing stuff that for, that's right for your environment. And that way you're going to get the latest and greatest straight away. Um, so then, you know, what else can you do in regards to how you're, so you're actively doing the firmware updates. Um, but what should you be doing to lock down the, the wires? So again, we, we talked about secure boot. Um, and how do you automate this in your environment so that you can do this without touching the machine? Um, because I, you know, I visit a lot of customers where the, the IT help desk, they get the machine out of the box, they prep the BIOS 
with certain settings. So, you know, they enable the TPM chip, they turn on secure boot, they put a password in, and that's a manual process. And that becomes quite you know, lengthy when you've got hundreds of machines. So it's about leveraging the uh, manufacturer tools again to automate this for you in your task sequence. So, I mean, the Dell CCTK is one that I've used quite a lot. Um, very simple to use. Uh, Dell are actually moving away from the CCTK more to WMI-based platform, um, which they're, uh, I think, to publish documentation on. Um, but that ties in with Lenovo. So Lenovo have been using WMI for setting the settings for, for quite a while. Um, and it, it makes sense that, you know, more manufacturers are going to move to a kind of a more like a common way of doing this rather than their own specific tools that they will have different, you know, have their own classes, but you'll be able to look at this and see, okay, I can manage this easier. Um, HP, again, they have their bias configuration utility. Um, they actually have a PowerShell module, again, for setting settings. That one is probably, a, it's, an, it's an older version where it's using text files of exported models. So typically what you do is you get your reference model, you export all the settings out of it, you go through the text and you you know make changes, you remove what you don't want or enable features, and then you push that out to all those models. Um, and Microsoft have their own firmware tools as well for the Surface devices. So now, after we've, uh, we've layered on um, the firmware, we've enabled the TPM and everything, um, we're going to go on and we're going to talk about managing disk encryption. And I, I mean, Paul, this is one of the things we talked about at the start, but it, it really has kind of been a, a, a no brainer for people as they transition to Windows 10. But I don't know about you, but one of the things that I see a lot is people still think about the laptop as being core. So I think you're going to kind of ch try to challenge that as well in this next episode. Yeah. Yeah, whether I can convince people is another story. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, the HP BIOS tool I've used quite a lot, and uh, I do like the fact that you can um, merge all your settings on different models into one text file and mm. cut down a lot of complexity there and just have kind of one step potentially to push out for all your different variants. Um, but yeah, let's, let's chat about uh, disk encryption. Uh, we, we're splitting this topic, so... Um, I'll kickstart this. Okay, so as, as Morris mentioned, do we encrypt just laptops or or not? Um, it, this all depends, really. I mean, you know, ultimately, if you're encrypting a device that's got sensitive data on it, whether it be a laptop or a desktop, you should really be encrypting that device. Um, some businesses aren't really required to do that though they'll have uh, a legislation or, or requirement just to uh, encrypt mobile devices so that's exactly what they do and they can kind of challenge if if something gets taken and it's so long as they don't have sensitive data on there or data's not at risk then they kind of mitigate that um, but really these days uh, with ssds in place um, there's minimal performance impact uh, when when those devices are encrypted, so there should be no real reason to to sort of you know not do the desktops as such, and you know any desktop can be picked up, taken, etc. So that's our advice really. Um, with um, talk about performance with the old spindle style disks, um, the HDDs. Yeah, not not much of an impact really on the read performance, but you could get some obvious uh, performance loss when writing. So if you've got the older devices and, and their desktops and you don't want to encrypt them, you may decide that's not worth it because of the, the impact there. But Paul, I think the thing about is a machine portable though. I mean, mm. yeah, if, you, if you go back five years when everyone had a large form factor desktop, um, yeah, fine. People aren't going to walk out the door typically with a desktop. Um, yeah. These days, you know, as we were discussing, you know, the very small form factor um, desktops mm. are out there now are smaller than, than a laptop. So yeah. 
What, yeah. what makes it portable it, in that, that case? Yeah, uh, but yeah, it goes down to this, does the device have data on it? And, and if, mm. the, if the business isn't legislated to protect that, then they don't. But, you know, ideally just encrypt, you know, just get those devices encrypted and get them secured. What's the overhead? It's negligible, isn't it? Um, and BitLocker provides that solution. Um, and, and, and does so with these, and, and, and obviously with BitLocker, rather than third party, uh, solutions we can go from baseline to baseline and the ease of updating uh, is 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 far simpler than, than any kind of third party and the process to do that um, so the next the next point here is around the cipher strengths that we have with BitLocker um, AES XTS 256 was introduced uh, with Windows 10 15 11 uh, but that particular, um, that, that's the particular cipher strength you should be using. It provides the highest level of protection. However, that is not a default when you're using config manager. So you have to call that out in your task sequence. Um, and you can see here in this example, uh, we use this uh, registry key uh, to set the encryption method to the value of seven, which is the 256 encryption. And we have to use that in any kind of uh, task sequence prior to any pre-provisioning or prior to, if we're not using pre-provisioning, then prior to the enable BitLocker step being called. If you don't set that in the right place, then you're going to be defaulting to the 128 um, algorithm strength, um, which you can't just flip. So if you do set that incorrectly and you've got devices out there using it and you want to go to 256, then you're going to have to decrypt and then re-encrypt the new uh, algorithm in place. Uh, next up is the question of should you be using uh, FVE for volume encryption or use space? Well, this is usually dictated by the IT sec team who may have some compliancy around this or may just enforce that and say this is what you have to use. Um, the advantage of use space is that you can obviously encrypt in a much uh, shorter time. Uh, and, you know, this, this encryption type should really be used on new volumes. Uh, if you are if you are uh, encrypting devices that have already had data on them, then ideally you should be using FVE. But there is an option if you are using new space to um, apply a manage BDE um, hyphen white free space uh, command. And what that does is it wipes the free space on the volume, uh, removing any, any, fragment, any fragments may have existed in the space. Uh, effectively, running this will provide the same level of protection as uh, full volume encryption. But again, this is not built in to your config manager task sequence, and you would have to call that out um, post the encryption, uh, yeah, post the encryption or pre-provisioning, sorry, taking place. Hey, Paul, it's Bill. I want to jump in for just a moment to let people attending the webinar know that we are going, we had scheduled it for an hour. There's a lot of great content here and we decided to just let all of it, uh, you know, be available to you. So if you have another, you know, have a hard stop, need to do something else, know that if you signed up for the webinar, we're going to send you the recording of the whole thing so you can pick this up. If you have time, then you can stick around. There's a, a lot more on managing disk encryption and we're also gonna have an extended Q&A with Paul and Morris. So I just wanted to let you know that uh, you will get the information if you have to drop off and if you can stay fabulous. Cool, uh, cheers Bill. Okay, so um, yeah, full volume encryption. So this is something that until recently wasn't native in the config manager task sequence. Um, it's uh, been implemented in uh, config manager 1806 and as you'll see from this uh, graphic here, the useful encryption checkbox is part of the pre-provisioning BitLocker step, but also you'll see that on the enable BitLocker step as, uh, as well. So you uh, can, just, uh, sorry. Yeah, just, just worth noting, uh, update your boot images as well. Uh, see a lot of people going, yeah, 1806 and then deploying that with a 1709 and then it, it doesn't it. work. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I was just about to say, so, yeah, the boot image needs an update. So there's a, an exe file there that uh, needs to be updated in that boot image. It's the OSD offline BitLocker exe. 
that won't understand the uh, slash full switch. So as Morris says, uh, when you're applying 1806, if you haven't yet, update that boot image to take full advantage of FV in the task sequence. Uh, and then really we've got a run through here of uh, the, the options for your key uh, recovery storage uh, with BitLocker, um, AD, MBAM, Azure AD, and then third party solutions like uh, Sophos, for example, that manage BitLocker. Uh, my personal preference is MBAM. I think, Morris, are you with me on that? Yeah, I still think it provides the most functionality for, for companies. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the, the obviously the key rotation um, advantage is, is something that's that's big. I mean, and it, it just stops someone typing out their the recovery key and putting it onto a sticker underneath the machine because I, I I've seen that happen. So. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, that key can't be used again. It, it rotates uh, exactly as you say. Um, there's also the the, uh, the portals, the help desk and the self service portal. Uh, so you can uh, put the onus on the end user to actually recover the device. Whether they actually use that is another story. <laughs> it tends to be the call comes through to the help desk, but they do have that option. Uh, and also with MBAM, you're storing the key off in the SQL database securely, but that uh, role separation takes place between the key and the AD object. So if someone accidentally deletes the AD object, that's goodbye recovery key. So another great feature really for MBAM. And I think that the other one uh, I find is you, you've got the reporting tool as well. You can, if you if you um, install standalone, uh, you've got the reports, but you can also integrate them with Config Manager for a kind of single pane of glass. Um, and then you can take a look at what compliancy state your devices are in or not, and then look to solve that sort that problem out. Yeah, I mean, which you can actually do as well with um, your your configuration baselines, as you discussed earlier. Exactly. Um, so. So another win. Cool. Okay. So, all right. So I'm just going to pass back to yourself here to complete this uh, disk encryption section. Okay. So, what are the steps needed to enable disk encryption? Um, okay. Well, you need a TPM chip. You need it enabled. You need it activated. And as we talked about earlier on, really and truly, I'm saying enable secure boot. Um, one of the caveats you should think about as well, it, particularly if you're going down the Intune autopilot side of things, is the TPM version. So uh, a lot of machines in the past few years will obviously ship with TPM 2.0, um, but some would have had 1.2. And in those cases, um, manufacturers more than often will provide a again a firmware update to enable you to go up to version two so you can leverage some of the uh, the new features like device auto enrollment through uh, autopilot so um, something to be aware of um, the way manufacturers though when you're doing a kind of disk imaging process with bitlocker um, you, you'll want to clear the TPM when you're re-imaging the machine Vendors do things completely differently. Um, you know, HP, for instance, yeah, they, they, they'll take a, a PowerShell command which sets a WMI object that will enable TPM to be overwritten. Uh, whereas some like Dell, for instance, will require physical presence at the machines for the older generation. I, I know their they're latest generation machines, uh, some of them will now allow that physical presence bypass. Um, but again, this is, a kind of a demo tile sequence. So in this instance, we're using the Lenovo as an example. Um, and this is what your tile sequence would look like to set all the kind of precursor settings for uh, BitLocker to be enabled. Um, so you can see, again, we've turned on the, the chip, we've activated. We enabled virtualization so we could use the likes of Credential Guard. Um, we turned off the physical presence bypass. Um, then we've you know, we've got this structured as well. So Lenovo is an example where they've got two different types of uh, sets of commands, one for their ThinkPad range, one for their Think Center. So something you need to uh, obviously cater for in your tile sequence. And I know it can get quite complex. I mean, when you're looking at um, environment where you've got multi-vendor, um, your tile sequence is going to be quite big. But again, it's all about just doing these few steps getting everything automated, and then machines will fly out. Um, 
I think a key thing as well, Morris, is ensuring once you've got those set and you've got it in here, it's, it's issuing a restart, isn't it, for those settings to take uh, effect? Yeah, I know. So the, yeah, if we went further down the task sequence, obviously yeah, we're going to do, do a restart, get the settings to apply. Um, so then the OS gets laid down and everything like that. But yeah, yeah I mean, and if, if someone was looking for demo task sequences or something like that, I'm sure, you know, I, I'd be willing, obviously, to provide something if if people need to see it more in depth. Um, so what does it look like from an Intune perspective? Um, so the, the settings, again, through an MDM policy, uh, through Windows encryption, and then we can uh, give actually a new feature, we can allow standard users to encrypt the drive. Um, and again, all, you know, the cipher strengths that we talked about earlier on, the XDSA AS256, we can specify that for the uh, the OS drive, fixed disks, and so on. Um, one of the things with disk encryption, though, I, I don't know, Paul, where you see the majority of your customers, but TPM or TPM versus PIN. Um, yeah. yeah. I, Combination. I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm leaning more towards the just TPM side of things. Yeah, uh, it really, it depends on what the customer wants. Um, becomes a challenge with TPM and PIN, but um, I, I tend to find MBAM helps with that process as well. Yeah, the way you, you can clear the uh, the PIN. Um, but it, it, I mean, it, it, the thing that's having a PIN, okay, yes, it adds an, another layer of security, if you like. Um, but there's the issue of if okay if if someone leaves the company and they don't give in the pin and you don't have MMAM, you know, how do you get in and, and yeah, all kinds of different scenarios where you're having to get recovery keys for this that and the other. Um, it, even was for it, admins to visit the, the, the desk and, and do work and have to issue a restart, they have to do that recovery to then get the device back up and running if they don't know that pin. Yeah, or they're going to have to suspend BitLocker for the restart, yeah. which potentially leaves a security issue then as well. And again, yeah, you know, I, I think one of your examples was a security baseline with BitLocker. So you, I, I do that quite a lot as well, where um, you'll have a, or sorry, a configuration baseline um, where it'll go out and check and see if the protectors that should be enabled are enabled. And if not, re-enable them. Just in case something has yeah. happened, suspended something and it's gone a bit too long. So, the, the bit, Paul, you were talking about with the, the key recovery. Um, so the, I've just kind of laid the, the different options here. Um, so manage BD, um, command line. So you can obviously get your recovery keys and you can export them out to a file if you want, for instance. Uh, but also I use it just for validating, typically during an MBAM installation, that the keys that I'm seeing there are obviously the ones matching in the database. Because if they don't match, that would be bad. Um, Azure Active Directory, um, again, as we move more and more to modern management style of things, um, the end user can actually recover their own BitLocker key from their profile inside uh, their, their AD tenant. Um, but the, the one thing that, you know, that MBAM offers, which we have on the right, is, is the ability to self-service this kind of thing. And the the rollover of uh, encryption keys, I think, is is kind of a big thing, a big selling point for MBAM. I mean, it is a legacy product; it is quite old, but it still does the job very well. Um, and I suppose the one thing that we should mention about MBAM when you're implementing it is to ensure that you have the latest service release for it as well, because if you don't, and you've just got say the 2.5 SP1 installation you'll have it reporting back that devices are non-compliant. For instance, if you're using AES-256 that you've specified with the XTS uh, switch in your task sequence, because the uh, the client doesn't know how to look for it. So again, you need to have everything up to date. Um, there's a couple of commands down there, as you can see, just to return the recovery keys. Um, Get BitLocker volume is going to return back all information, you know, what's cipher strength, if it's full, use this, and so on. So now I think we've run over a slight bit, um, but we have. So uh, we're going to yeah. jump in here. I'll take over and take just a uh, few moments to let people know what. Um, 
share this window, what Adaptiva can offer. And then we'll dive in. There are a lot of questions and feel free to ask more. Then we'll dive into an extended Q&A. Okay, is my screen presenting? Not quite yet. Let's get that up. Okay, now I think we're good. So our, at Adaptiva, our flagship product is Adaptiva OneSite, which will extend Configuration Manager to reliably distribute any software at unparalleled speed and massive scale. We recently had an independent research company talk to our customers to find out uh, you know, what, why they were using it and, and how well it's working for them or if it's not, what's the issue. Uh, so 81% picked, uh, chose it because it was, or one of their challenges was imp impacting the WAMP. They were having problems getting their content out and not over uh, overloading their WAN. 65% were having problems with costly server infrastructure. 50% just didn't have enough IT staff time, and they were looking for ways to reduce the amount of time they spent on some basic recurring tasks. 44% were having Windows deployment issues, mainly around the amount of time it was taking to deploy Windows 10. And 34% uh, were having an issue with high delivery failure rates, which we'll take a look here at uh, what kinds of results people have been reporting with one site. Uh, WAN protection, 95% of our customers had said that one site eliminated worries about WAN congestion. And the technical details of this are available in a webinar I'll point you to. So I'm just going to tell you, you know, that's the result. And if you want to know how it works and if it works for you or if you want to look at using it in your environment, you can come to our product webinar and learn more. Cost reduction, so 77%. Uh, save their organization over $100,000, over 50% save $250,000 or more, and over a quarter, say, or no, actually it's 14% saved over a million. It was over a quarter that saved half a million or more. Time savings, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of ways that Adaptiva um, saves people time. So, Basically, the result here is there are a lot of quotes about it's very uh, it's very useful. It can be used with low administrative effort. We we can see a couple of the big ways. So, in addition to just automating or simplifying repetitive work that you do, some speeding up you know day to day tasks, we also provide great time savings in accelerated OS deployment. Forty three percent of our customers say that using Adaptive One Site has accelerated their Windows 10 deployment timelines by six months or more. So that's that's a massive impact on your ability to drive your company forward into Windows 10 successfully. And the software also works great for uh, continued ongoing maintenance and servicing post delivery, post deployment. Um, and this is an interesting one, software delivery success rates up by more than 20%. Um, and we're seeing that that's uh, over a quarter of our customers actually had 50% or greater improvement in their software delivery success rate. So as configuration manager admins know, when your software is not getting out there, if you understood it, small number of, of failures, you have to track them down. And each of those can take a significant amount of time. So the more you can do to improve your delivery success rates, the better. And this is a huge strength of the Adaptiva environment, is it's a complete self-managing system that wants to make everything work without your involvement. So it's a it's a really great way to reduce the amount of time you spend tracking down those failed deployments. And we also offer client health, which is a health and security tool. You can proactively discover and automatically resolve endpoint vulnerabilities to reduce help desk tickets and drive security and compliance at scale. In a nutshell, you can uh, find issues. You can drive endpoint compliance at scale here. Basically, you can automatically assess things like, is every machine in line with company policy? Are, you, are your industry best practices for health and security applied on every system? And you can um, pull in some industry standard configuration benchmarks and run those. You can 
check security hygiene standards on every system. So this is an easy way to look at every system from a lot of different perspectives of health and security, and then automatically remediate any issues. That's fixing. So you can, <clears throat> you know, if you have systems that are out of compliance, whatever it is, we can go in and you can set up health checks. We provide you over 100 out of the box. It's really easy to create your own that will automatically go in and fix those vulnerabilities. So let's harden those attack surfaces. And it does all this using, you know, this really mature, proven peer to peer and network delivery platform. So you're not impacting your network or your end user systems. And then Flex refers to the flexibility. You can adapt to changing security conditions without coding. You can easily uh, use a visual designer to build your own workflows, checks and remediations, or you can integrate with any third party product, security solutions, scripting or programming language. A few quick quotes. Uh, I'm just gonna read one of them, which is that 100% of surveyed global 500 and Fortune, 100, Fortune 500 customers would recommend Adaptiva. I think that speaks volumes about how well the software works and how diligently our support team works with customers to ensure their success. And this is all available through the independent research company Tech validate, and that's why we have these IDs. So reach out if you want more information. Learn more, a few things coming up. We have a product webinar in two weeks. If you want to learn more about our products with Chaz Spawn, Senior Solutions Architect, and that'll be at nine in the morning on Tuesday, the 26th. Uh, Morris and Paul will be writing uh, security snacks. So we're going to have weekly security news turned into actionable information for configuration manager administrators. And this is huge. Paul and Morris have been, uh, they've agreed to take this on and they're gonna be every week going through what is happening in the world of cybersecurity and hey, let's see what's interesting to the admins out there and let's give them some tech info. So I'm very excited about that. And we're gonna launch our first one next week. Morris and Paul, you guys are, uh, Thinking about that and excited about it, I'm assuming. <laughs> Absolutely. There we are. Indeed, yeah. And, uh, and we have a report that Paul did uh, late last year, managing Windows 10 security using Configuration Manager. And you can um, get that at our Adaptiva Academy, www.adaptiva.com slash academy. And the security snacks, I have the URL here. It's insights.adaptiva.com slash security dash snacks. And with that, I'm going to launch into Q&A. OK, guys, we have, uh, we have a, whole, uh, a whole bunch of questions here. Go ahead and uh, begin. See what, uh, what you want to. Yeah, I, I've been looking down through the list. And there is a bit of a common theme. People asking, uh, isn't MBAM being retired? And I mean, yes, it, it is in the process. It is a legacy product. Um, it is come to extended support and where i would see it going is obviously we can store recovery keys in azure ad now and with everything you know the move to modern management i'm sure microsoft will inevitably listen to their customers and you know if there's features that are blocking people moving away from mbam they don't want that as well so um it's not that we're saying you know invest all your time in a legacy product just to change but for now if you need like the likes of a help desk functionality or a key rollover and that mbam is the is the product to go for so yeah I, and also I, you know we're not all not every not every customer is going cloud there's still an element of management that's required on prem and you know whilst mbam at the moment has that support and and life uh, already defined i think we'll be seeing something in the future that's that's manages this and they have to cater for the on-prem customers um I, I was trying i'm trying to find the question here but there was someone mentioned about the um reading more information on the new update types um you can take a look at there's a white paper out there already if you do a google search for psfx white paper that will uh, give you a, a search result back where you can click 
to download uh, the white paper that goes through and explains the, the, the process in more detail. So here, I'll call a few out. It appears that the uh, service stack updates, SSU, will not abide by this new model. Is there a, still a prereq relationship, prereq relationship to some CUs and a non-consultant SSU release cadence? Is that correct? Yeah, so as far as we're aware, yeah, that still remains as is. Um, we're still looking for functionality within WSUS that can order these updates for us. If we've got our Intune-based devices that go out to Windows Update, that that prereq is already done for us, but for our on-prem config manager devices, there's a bit of tweaking or play to, to, to get involved in there to make sure those SSUs come down first. And um, Mike Tyrrell did uh, a good blog about this recently where he used uh, configuration baselines and the software update process that I demoed earlier to uh, apply the SSUs, get devices compliant, and then he would target his uh, monthly updates to the devices that reported back as compliant. So, you know, little, little ways to do it sort of out uh, that aren't native and, and, and require a bit of work. Uh, but yeah, as far as we're aware at the moment, the SSUs will still need a bit of coaxing beforehand uh, until WSUS can play ball and, and order this for us. Um, Daniel asks if it's possible to publish some reference docs for the new updating moduling for Windows 10 updates in SCCM. Yeah, actually, I'll reach out to you, Daniel, and see what exactly you're looking for. Uh, that's the kind of, if there's something of value to you out there, uh, we would love to help provide it. So, is the slide deck going to be available? Absolutely. You'll get an email within a day or two here with the deck and uh, an on demand recording. How to check in client side? What are the policies applied for Windows Defender? Do you know the answer to that one? Again, that's going to be looking at um, the Defender logs to see what's been put down. Um, so that's the, the true source of everything that gets put onto the machine. Um, so I think we, we covered that in one of the uh, the demos. Okay, good, good. And looking through here. Uh, there was actually one there by uh, a guy who was asking about the security features we talked about. Um, yeah, sorry, just minor correction. The Windows 10 Enterprise uh, security features talked about, and they are also available in Windows 10 Educational Edition for those in an educational space. Yeah. The, the two called out there on that question, Credential Garden ATP, uh, you don't get those in Windows 10 Pro. If, pros the release of Windows 10 that you're dealing with. Okay, and uh, can we block USB storage device with endpoint protection? And is there a granularity possible to define which uh, can of device, I think mean, which device can be, which parts of the device can be blocked? Can we set granularity uh, by user or only by computer? Yeah. Well, go on, Morris, you, you, you go for it. Yeah, so I, I know what they're looking to do there. So they want to say limit, uh, you know, to a certain USB device or, you know, is it just an encrypted stick? So there's there's ways you can do that through group policy. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely... I was, I was, yeah, go on. Sorry, I was going to say, this, this tends to be one of the areas where third-party products really shine. Um, mm. And if you're looking at moving away from third party security stack um, and doing some gap analysis on, you know, should you move across the defender? I tend to find talking to the customers I've been dealing with that this is one area they use. And unfortunately, it's not mature uh, at all. Uh, and as you say, for, for Microsoft, as you say, you've got to go into AD and use group policy. Uh, and it's you're looking at uh, the, the hardware IDs or the class IDs um, to define what you're going to block. But they can be defined to user or device, if I remember correctly. Uh, but I would say the third party products kind of win in that area at the moment for sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly on catch up in that respect. Um, but you're all singing all dancing products. Yeah, some of the third party stuff, do stuff like that well. 
Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Morris, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody who dialed in. We'll be sending out those um, the on-demand version of the webinar, as well as the slides and links to more information if you want that as well. Okay, cheers, everyone. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever, whatever time it is where you're at. Cheers. And thanks again, Paul and Morris. Thank thanks. you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.